Hello and welcome to another off-the-shelf board game review. This week we're going to look at Dreadball Season Number 2. Season Number 2 expands the base game by adding in four brand new teams to the game, additional league rules and coaches and cheerleaders expanding the game, adding a little more replayability and a lot more variety, especially with the extra teams. Now if you're not familiar with Dreadball, Dreadball is a science fiction futuristic two-player miniatures game that emulates a futuristic version of if you were to pick a sport as closest to resembling it would be basketball, especially with the way the game doesn't reset after a team scores. Now I'm not going to do a full review of the basic game, this is going to concentrate only on season number two. If you want to learn how to play Dreadball, I'm going to put a link in the, sh in the notes here for my original Dreadball review which explains how to play the game, has a sample term, and also goes over my final thoughts on the overall game. What I do want to do with this video review though is I want to cover two points. One, I got a couple emails from people wondering just how difficult is it to get into a miniatures game, especially for somebody who is not a hobbyist. Some people thought that this game would be a little bit too difficult for them because they didn't feel like they could put the miniatures together and then paint them. And the other thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at how much Season 2 adds to the base game. What I'm going to do is this is going to be a two-part video. It's all going to be one video so you don't have to hunt down for multiple videos to find the complete overview of the game. But I'm going to put a timestamp in the notes and then on the first half I'm going to show you how to put the models together from the Season 2. I'm going to take the two most difficult models to put together, the Zor Bug Team and also the Robot Team. They come with the most smallest parts and in my opinion are the most difficult to put together. I'm going to show you how to put them together. I'm going to show you a very quick, very efficient paint scheme to show you how quickly and easily you can actually put your teams together, get them to the table and able to play and enjoy this very fun futuristic sports game. Then after that, I'm going to take a few moments to tell you exactly what Season 2 adds to the game, give a little bit of a breakdown of what the new teams add to the game, and the new coaching rules, new league rules, and give you my overall opinion on what Season 2 adds to Dreadball. Now before you get started putting your models together, you're going to need a couple items that you're going to pick up. I'm going to give you my recommendations and the only reason why I recommend these is just because these are the things I've had the best luck with. First of all, I'm going to show you what I haven't had much luck with. I know some people just tell you go to Michael's or Joanne's and buy the quick Artist Lofts paints and in my experience these don't work too well. My problem with them is they're usually much too thick to be put on plastic miniatures. Now if you want to take the time to purchase these, they are very inexpensive, you can. But then I recommend you get a little dropper bottle that you can add water to to water those paints down because otherwise they're going to be far too thick to put on miniatures, especially when you start improving with your skills and start adding more details to the miniatures like eyes and painting on numbers and extra special small intricate de details. Personally, I, there's two paint lines I stick with. I use the Citadel Miniature Paint Line, which I've had a lot of success with. And these are the ones I generally use most often. Main reason why is because for the quality, they're usually the cheapest, at least at my local store. And the other one is the is this brand, which you can also buy. Both of those work really well. Haven't had any problems with them. They're the great consistency. They paint on really well. No problems there. That's just what I use. You also want to get a spray paint for a base coat. Now there's two different kinds of spray paints you can get. You can go just to your local hardware store and buy the Krylon Fusion brand. This actually works really, really well, but I'm going to tell you, make sure you do not get the glossy kind because it's going to make it much more challenging to paint. Make sure you always get the dull, non-glossy version, and these work just fine. Or if you want to, you can get the slightly more expensive stuff from the hobby stores. In all honesty, between these two, the only difference I've seen is price. You can use either one. I would actually say use these. Just make sure you do not get the glossy kind because you're not going to like those final results you're going to get when you base coat your miniatures. Next thing you're going to need is you're going to need a good glue. This is the one I personally use. This is the style of glue is you're going to want to use this. It doesn't matter what brand you're going to use, but it has to be this kind of glue because this is a very fast bonding. Your miniatures will stay together for a long time and this is just a really good, easy one to use. No problems. Nice little dropper tip. You just put a few drops. Your models adhere together. Great kind. This is the one I'd recommend for you. You also want to pick up a couple paint brushes. Now paint brushes have a number which says their size on them. You probably want to get a 10-0, a 5-0, and then just go buy a couple of the cheap hobby paint brushes that you find at Michael's that fall apart pretty quickly. But you usually get a, a dozen of them for just a couple dollars. 
All you really need are a couple really nice brushes, then a, a package of the cheap ones, and you're good to go. Finally, pick up a good X-Acto knife. That's just to help you. Sometimes you're going to need it, and I'll show you why when we get to putting together the miniatures. This is pretty much all you're going to need to do what I'm about to show you. Total, probably about $20 investment to get you started to paint your miniatures and get them ready to play Dreadball. The painting method I'm showing you is just a basic, very quick dry basing or dry brushing technique after a good base coat over the top of the miniature. It's, I'm not saying this is the best way to do it, just for me it's the quickest and the easiest. There is an alternate method called the dip method, where you basically do a quick paint job on your miniature and then you dip it in polyurethane. I have never used this method. I don't know how good or bad it is. I've heard a lot of people say they've had a lot of good success with it. Um, I just never done it because I didn't want to mess with polyurethane, so that's just personal. I don't know how good it is. You can try it, and there are very good videos that show you how to do that. There's also some instructions. There's a complete geek list that tells you how to do it from scratch over at BoardGameGeek.com. I'll also add, a, also add a link to that in the show notes. Basically, when you're done, this is going to be the final results of your miniature. Again, this isn't showroom quality or anything that's going to win your awards, but it's good enough that you can be able to play with the miniature, and it's going to show that the miniature is painted. And at least you can see a little bit of detail in the miniature, and this takes less than five minutes if you take out drying time. If you take a whole series of ten of these, you're looking at an hour's worth of work, including drying time, because you're basically going to do one miniature, move on to the next, do one miniature, move on to the next, and you literally have your entire team done in approximately one hour. Go ahead and get started with the Zor team. Now the Zor team is probably the team that has the most smallest little pieces. Don't be intimidated by this fact because these guys can be put together by anybody, even myself. I have very large hands. I'm able to palm a basketball, so if my giant gorilla hands can put these guys together, I think anybody can put these guys together. The easiest way to start is once you pour them out of the plastic and um, throw them down on the tabletop, separate all the pizza pieces that match together with other pieces. Put the arms together, the heads together, and the bodies together. Once you have all the pieces separated, the next thing you're going to do is remove all the flash from the models. Now flash is generally called, caused by the mold lines where the model is attached to the sprue where it came from and it's actually pretty quick and easy to remove these. Basically you just grab the model and you usually see a piece, something such as this where it's sticking out just a little bit. Get the camera to focus here really quick. Basically this is the piece where the model is attached to the mold line. Pretty much just simply take your X-Acto knife and make sure you have a cardboard underneath whatever you're cutting because this X-Acto knife will cut down to the table. Basically just a little bit of pressure and you cut the piece off. And again, you'll definitely want to have cardboard underneath because the exact knife is sharp. It is going to cut a lot of things. And you may have to go back and just take a little bit. Sorry, new blade there. Should have checked it for plastic. You have to take a little bit of the corner off there. Just take your exacto knife, a little bit of cutting. Usually very quick and simple. These plastics aren't hard to cut, but you have to go through and do this with the models. Um, shouldn't take you too long, maybe a couple minutes to do this. And you want to make sure you check all the pieces for this, especially the pieces such as the arms. You're going to see a little bit of plastic where they hang over. And these are molded to fit in a certain way in the model. So you want to make sure you do cut off that extra flash. Probably going to take you about five to ten minutes to do this. I'm going to go ahead and do this really quick off camera because I don't think you want to be bored by watching me sit there and cut a whole bunch of models for five minutes while nothing goes on. Once you trim all the flash on the models, the next thing you're going to want to do is do a dry fit to make sure you're attaching the right parts to the right parts of the bodies to put these miniatures together. Now all these miniatures are molded so you should be able to technically only put them together one way. If you look at here, I don't know if Cam will be able to focus in on this, hopefully well, you'll see that the hole for where the arm should be is different design than the hole on this side. That's going to help you put the model together correctly, put the right arms on the correct side. My recommendation is just to simply do a quick dry fit run to make sure that the pieces you're going to be attaching are going to fit to the model and to make sure that you have actually attached the correct pieces on the model correctly. And just simply push them in, check the corners, make sure it's fitting up and lining up on all four of the corners. Do that for all the pieces, the arms, everything that's going to be attached to that sim simple model. Once you see that everything is lining up properly and doesn't look like it needs to be trimmed at all, what you're ready to do is simply just glue the model together. Just simply take the model, put a little drop of glue in the location where you're trying to uh, attach the model part together.
and then attach the part to the model. And the nice thing about this glue is you generally only have to hold it for probably about five to 10 seconds and this glue will seal really quickly and the models will be held together very quickly. So it's not like this is a long process at all. This glue is pretty quick. It's already set. It's not, you know, I couldn't play with it right now, but it's gonna start bonding instantly. You simply put all the models together and then you're gonna be ready to base coat. I'm gonna go ahead and do that off camera again because again, don't wanna bore you with putting these models together. Just trying to show you that they are actually pretty easy to put together once you know what you're doing. Once you're done gluing your miniatures together, the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna base coat the miniatures. And the easiest way to do this, again, I'm trying to show you a method that's extremely easy and extremely quick. These aren't gonna be showroom quality miniatures, but they're definitely gonna be good enough to play with and actually enjoy to the, add to the enjoyment of the game because they're gonna look decent on the, on the game board. Anyways, when you're base coating your miniatures, what you wanna do is you wanna pick a color that is gonna be the dominant color for that miniature. For example, if you're painting a human team and their team colors were green and blue, if there's gonna be mainly a blue miniature with green highlights, you're gonna spray paint the entire thing blue. And then for the example of the Zor bugs, their main color is a dark chitinous kind of brown color. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna find a brown spray paint. You wanna go with a darker one because it's gonna be showing the darker recesses and I'll explain that when we get to the highlighting part later. But you wanna find the darkest brown that you can and you're gonna spray paint the entire miniature brown, everything, you're gonna cover all of it. What I wanna tell you though is make sure you don't attach the bases yet. Of course you can, but I prefer the clear plastic bases and I think it looks a little bit nicer when you have the clear plastic bases. Of course, if you want to, you can attach the bases, but that means the bases are gonna be spray painted whatever color you're spray painting the base coat. So I recommend don't attach them yet. You can if you want, but I'm gonna say, for my suggestion, don't attach those bases yet. So simply what you're gonna do is you're gonna take some cardboard, head out to a nice ventilate area, take each one of your miniatures, place them on the cardboard, and you're gonna spray paint them completely one solid color. After they've all been spray painted, you're gonna let them dry, and I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now, and I'm gonna bring them all back. Once they all have their base coat, I'm gonna show you what the next step is. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna ink the miniatures, and this is gonna add a little bit of background shades and kind of makes the edges of the model pop a little bit more. It's a quick little easy step and all you're gonna do is find a dark shade and since the models already are dark brown, we wanna find a shade that's a little darker. So I'm gonna pick Nuln Oil, which is a black ink color. And if you look at this stuff, it's pretty much liquid ink. It's very, very runny. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it and we're simply gonna apply it all over the model completely everywhere. And you just take a junky paintbrush, not gonna be a nice fancy paintbrush or anything like that and take it and just simply apply it all over the model. This is gonna add a little bit of black and you're gonna put on, not super thick, it, but you wanna put on well enough that it's going into the recesses and the cracks of the model. You wanna go all over the model and again, just make sure you're hitting all the cracks and all the recesses and it's gonna add shading to the model. And again, this is a super quick process. It should take about 20 seconds for each model. And basically it's gonna add a whole bunch of dark recesses, which is gonna help when we get to the part where we're gonna do the shadowing and the shading of the model. Hopefully the camera will focus here. There you go. And again, not gonna be dowsing the model, just basically allowing the ink to go into the recesses of the model, which is gonna add to the shading of the model. And now we're gonna to get to the part where we're dry brushing the miniature. And basically what this is gonna entail is we're gonna take a color that is like the base color that's currently on the model, but just a couple of shades lighter. And you wanna get some of that paint on the tip of your brush, but you want a little bit, so you're actually gonna wipe off the excess of the brush. So the point where your brush is actually almost dry, but there's still just a little bit of paint residue on it. Then you're gonna take the miniature and you're gonna paint along the ridges. So for example, this bug miniature has ridges on its back that go from left to right. So we're gonna paint from front to back or back to front, basically in a way just to hit those ridges ever so slightly. And you're gonna see just an ever so slight amount of paint going on the miniature. And that's gonna keep, uh, create the illusion of shadow on the miniature. And you're just gonna do this on the miniature, basically hitting just the tips of the model, not making sure none of the paint goes in the recesses. And you're gonna go around, again, continuing to make sure you only paint along the ridges. And this is something you'll get better with more practice. And I'm just gonna go ahead and do this really quickly on just a couple parts of the miniature just so you can see what the final results will look like. 
and if the camera will focus in hopefully you'll be able to see that you can see just the highlights in the miniature and it creates an illusion of depth on the miniature. You're basically going to go through and do that with all the miniatures and create that depth and that shadow on the miniatures and once you're done with that you're just going to add some details to them. I'm going to go ahead and quickly shadow the rest of these really quick or dry brush the, re dry brush the rest of these really quickly. And I'll come back and show you how to some details and you're going to be done with your miniatures and ready to play. Once you're done dry brushing, you're going to have a miniature that's going to look like it's not perfect, obviously, because this, again, this is supposed to be just for quick painting purposes. But if you look, you can actually see the details in the miniature. You can see that there's actual ridges and it creates, again, the illusion of shadows. This miniature, all you got to do to it now is just add a couple details. I'm going to take a few moments and give his eyes a little bit of color. Going to paint his talons black and also going to paint his little tiny fingers black. Going to base the miniature on the bottom black because I like to have a contrast in the actual miniature itself so it looks a little bit better. And then I'll go through and find anything that may, looks like I may want to make it stand out. Like I may take his little chitinous nose and paint it more of a bone in color. Again, just adding a little bit of a couple of details, but those little small details are really going to make the model pop. Once you're done, again, total process, maybe about 10, 15 minutes the first couple of times you do this, but once you've done this a couple of times, you go to get this down to five to 10 minutes, you have one of these models completed. I'm going to go ahead and add some details to this model. I'll come right back and show what the final model will look like. After adding a couple of details, your final results will look something like this. Now again, I want to emphasize this is not a professional painting job. This is basically just showing you how to paint the models so they look decent on the board so you can get out there and have fun with playing Dreadball. You get to see a little bit of the details. The only thing I added was the base. I painted the corners, the three, het, three threat sides of the base red so you can see where the threat sides are so you can see where his facing is. Add a little bit of bone color for the parts of the body painting his eyes red and you have the final painted miniature. I hope you enjoyed this quick tutorial. It really was mainly directed at people who are sitting on the fence because they're intimidated that they heard that the models can be really difficult to put together for Dreadball. My hope was that by showing you this, you can see that it's actually pretty easy to put these models together, pretty easy to quickly paint these miniatures and get them to the quality where you can paint them quickly, get them on the board, and get out there and have fun playing Dreadball. Now let's get on to look at Dreadball Season Number 2. Dreadball Season Number 2 adds four brand new teams to the game. as the Robot Team, the Zor Team, the Judwan Team, and the alternate human team called the Void Sirens. All the new teams play just ever so slightly differently than the base teams. They're actually what I call more advanced teams. Again, not very difficult to play, but they definitely have their own statistics and their own strategies and ways to win the game and how they interact with the original four teams. Now of the four brand new teams, the Void Sirens at first glance would appear to be actually be like they may be the first team that is actually overpowered in Dreadball. They come with four coaching dice, they, all their jacks come with the ability called Running Interference, and that alone would be a pretty powerful ability, especially considering they start with three jacks on their team. And I'm sorry, they start with three strikers on their team, they start with four jacks on their team, and they start with one guard on their team. Which makes them play a little bit different from the basic human team, but when you look at the fact that they have four jacks to start with running interference, running interference is a pretty powerful ability. But the things that keep them and hold them back from being overpowered is the fact that they start with zero cards. And that means for the very first game until they get any experience and get some money put on their team, this team, for their very first game, cannot buy any cards throughout the game. Normally, you can buy cards on your turn, and those cards give you extra abilities like slams, extra moves, extra free abilities, allow certain models to act more than the limit of two times. But since the Void Sirens start with zero cards, they can't buy any cards during their first game. And they actually can't buy any cards for any of their games until they spend the 10 million credits for the ability to buy at least one card. That alone is a little bit of a hampering, but the fact that they also start with only one guard means that they do play a little bit differently than the basic human team. Now the nice thing is that you can actually, when you play your team, you don't have to have a male and a female team. You can actually play with the male models and play them as the Void Sirens, or you can play the female models and play them as the basic human team. So you do have that option if it matters to you. 
But once you make that decision, you have to stick with that style of team for the rest of the league play. So make sure you decide which form of the team you actually want to play. Now, the nice thing about the Void Sirens is that in the early game, on your very first game, whether you're playing just a, a standard one-off game or if you're playing the start of a league, it's really great that they start with four coaching dice, and that's going to help them start really strong in the beginning, early rounds of the game. And you're going to play these guys pretty aggressively to make sure you take advantage of those four coaching dice and score early. Because as the game wears on, you're going to start noticing that your advantage is going to start falling behind, especially if you have another player who is getting pretty good draws from the card deck because they're buying cards that are going to allow their, their guys to take those extra moves and start pulling the game back in their favor. So when you're playing the Void Sirens, you want to make sure you want to use aggressive use of your running interference ability, aggressive use of those four coaching dice, and you want to get the early scoring because towards the end of the game, you're going to start losing steam and start losing your advantage as the other player starts playing more and more cards, which is going to give their, un or their, their guys on their team the ability to make extra moves. Remember, the basic rule is you, one guy on your team can only make two moves plus, or I'm sorry, two actions plus having one card played on them. And since the Void Sirens can't buy cards, the most, any, the most amount of moves any Void Siren player can ever make is two actions, whereas any player on any other team can make up to three actions. Again, that's going to make a huge difference towards the end of the game. Of course, a really nice upside to that is when the Void Sirens play as a league, the fact that they start with four coaching dice makes it very, very tempting to sacrifice those early coaching dice to buy early league extra coaching skill ups, which is going to help you start taking off in the later rounds of the game. So Void Sirens, really interesting team, really interesting play, really nice abilities, but they are limited and I feel pretty darn balanced. The next team that comes with the new season two is the robot team. Now the robot team is a really cool, really fun team. They start off with a complete team of jacks. So as soon as you put all your units on the board, they're all jacks, which means they're decent at everything, but not great at guarding, not great at striking. The cool thing about the robots is every single robot on your team has the ability called quick change artist, which means if you want to sacrifice an action, you can turn them from a guard to a striker if you play your actions correctly. And by that, I mean um, there is a, is a limit you have to go through the various forms. So a jack can become a guard, a guard can become a jack, but a guard can become a striker. You have to hit that jack form in the middle. So basically if you have a, a player on the board and he's a guard right now and you want to have a striker, you need to spend an action and turn him into a jack and spend another action and turn him into a striker. The nice thing about the robots though is that teams that like to hammer their opponents and cause a lot of injuries on their opponents such as the orc team have a little bit more trouble with these kind of teams because if you take out a few key players it doesn't really matter to the robot team because they're just going to use a quick change artist ability change their form and cover the holes in our team that you just caused by causing them injury to their team additionally overall the robots actually have some really really good stats the robots as in their guard form actually has the strength equivalent to the orc team which makes them really good bashers to help take out other players and cause those injuries their jacks have a really good speed, a movement of a six, and their strikers also have a pretty good move. It's a move of five, but still a pretty good move, especially when you compare it to the Forge Fathers, whose strikers only have a movement of four. Overall, the robot team is probably one of the most well-rounded teams, and possibly having the best jacks in the game. They have the highest move for a jacks player, and they're perfectly balanced with four stat all the way across which means they pretty much have a 50-50 shot on the die roll of making a success, making the robot team a really good team. Their big disadvantage though is that they start on the board as jacks. So if the other player starts with the ball and can take a really aggressive lead in the beginning of the game, they can take advantage of the fact that the robot team starts with all jacks on the board and they have to actually give up actions to change in the forms that the robot player needs to start filling up the holes in their offense and their defense. So when you're playing as a robot, don't feel bad if you start losing players because you can start filling those holes. And if you have an aggressive opponent, make sure you hold your opponent at bay in the beginning so you get your robots into the forms they need to be in to help shore up your defenses or your offenses so you can take the victory. The next new team is the Jedwans. Now the Jedwans are a really interesting team. They are all strikers. That's the only position they can have on their team is all strikers. Not only that, they can never slam an opponent or kick an opponent while they're down or do any fouls that are aggressive or offensive, which makes them a pretty interesting 
team because you cannot play them aggressively but they have the great ability that they can throw further than any team in the game yet a Jed one player can throw the ball up to 12 hexes away which is four hexes further than I'm sorry three hexes further than any other player currently every team has a limit on the throws of nine spaces the Jed one can do 12 spaces they can get that ball across the board quickly so if you're playing as a Jed one player great to get that ball across the board position your players so they're ready to receive catch the ball throw it and score quickly the downside to that is now as the Judd one if you're playing against a bruiser type of team that doesn't mind taking a few scores against them while they sit there and bash your players into the ground you're gonna have a little bit of trouble playing them you just have to make sure that you're fast quick score fast score often outplay your opponents and pretty much run circles around them especially with your ability to score all the way up to 12 spaces away across the board basically the Judd one are the Harlem Globetrotters of the Dreadball League and finally we have the Zor players the insect guys and these guys are really interesting and they kind of are a cross between a couple different abilities across different teams now the Zor all have the ability called can't feel a thing which means that anytime you knock them down they're gonna take one less point of damage making them really hard to hurt you have to do at least five points of damage to knock one of these guys out I'm sorry four points of damage to knock one of these guys out completely if you do only four points of damage to these guys they're only gonna be knocked to the third bin of the sin bin so again do full five points of damage otherwise they're gonna keep coming back into the game making it really hard to kill these guys or to squish them like you would squish a normal bug now the Zord they get all three positions all their guys get can't feel a thing and not only that but their guards have the ability called steady now steady is really nice but basically what it means is they're knocked down by slams they're only pushed back or they can take damage basically just like the dwarves which makes them a really really hardy team and their jacks have the ability to slide which means they can dash as part of an action now normally jacks can't dash when they use an action but these jacks can which mean they actually get across the board really quickly especially willing to press your luck and try to get those extra moves overall statistically the Zor are a little bit subpar compared to the other teams especially with their strikers the strikers aren't really good at making making goals but they do have the better move of the movement of a six and there's other statistics with their can't feel a thing means that if they get the ball they don't have to worry about another player coming by slamming them causing them to lose the ball and possibly cause them turnover which makes them a more of a slow moving defensive team not quite as slow moving and defensive as the Forge Fathers though, but pretty close across between the Forge Fathers and maybe more of the Orcs with a little bit of better ball control. I think all four of the teams that they've added for Season 2 are really, really good. They add a lot of variety to the game. They make it a lot of fun. They play differently. And they're also pretty much took care of my only concern when I originally reviewed Dreadball. My original concern was, you know, I said in my original review that I'm an old school Blood Bowl player and that I enjoyed Blood Bowl a lot, but the main problem I ever had with Blood Bowl is that, and you know, people argue this is probably intentional, but the teams were definitely not balanced. A halfling team would get stomped by pretty much 99% of all the other teams. So far to me, all the teams in Dread Ball seem fairly balanced. Um, I probably played well, I'm getting close to about 30 games now with all the teams, so I've had more experience with some teams versus the others. But so far, I haven't seen any that seem excessively unbalanced or seem like they're outclassed versus some of the other teams. All the teams definitely have their strengths that they need to play to, and if you don't play those strengths, you're definitely going to get defeated. And of course, you are kind of at the whim and the capriciousness of the dice. If the dice don't like you, well, you're probably not going to have much luck, no matter how good your skill is. But I've never seen a complete blowout because the dice have completely failed me. But again, good skill will kind of make up for that, especially with good card play. Now, if someone were to ask me, recommend one team from Season 2, tell me one team that I have to have because it adds so much, it makes the game play so much differently, what would be the one team I'd say, or what would the order I'd say if you can only pick, buy your teams one at a time, which teams would I recommend for you to buy? And if I had to pick one team, I'd definitely say you want to pick up the Judwans. The Judwans are the most unique out of all four of the new teams. The fact that they are a complete ball control, fast moving, 
high scoring team makes them really interesting. They actually play differently than the Vermin because the Vermin in season one were pretty much a high scoring team, but they really couldn't score too well, but they can definitely get that ball around the field and they can definitely move pretty quickly. The Judd one take that idea and that concept and improve on it by being better scorers, better ball controllers, and they can really move that ball down the field. With that total movement of 12 spaces, that's pretty much half the board in one throw. The next team I would probably pick would probably be the Robots. I like how they have different positions. I like playing them against bruiser type of teams like the Orcs, where they're, the Orc players try and knock out your players. Well, when you're a Robot player, you kind of just shrug whenever you lose to a player. If they take out your Robot who's currently a guard, well, you just turn one of your Jacks into a guard and you cover the hole in your team. I like that idea. It's fun playing with those bruiser teams because they really have to think about a new strategy to play against you. And I like how that kind of messes with your opponents. After that, it would be a toss-up between the Zor and the Void Sirens. Probably more towards the Zor because having a bug team on the board is kind of cool. And I like their ability to pretty much take the damage, kind of like the Forge Fathers can. But they have a little bit better ability to move around the board. Finally, I'd, the Void Sirens are also a great team. I like how they are actually different than the standard human team, which I think is a definite plus. They don't seem feel like a retread, and they aren't overpowered in comparison to the human team, the original human team, making them seem obsolete. The next two things added to the game in Season 2 are the cheerleaders and the coaching staff. And they both go hand in hand, so you pretty much should use both of them together, especially considering that the cheerleaders' main strength comes from the abilities of your coaching staff. Now the way the cheerleaders work is you're going to take your cheerleaders and you're going to place them on the board at the various scoring points. And as soon as you score that amount of points, if your cheerleader is on that space and you score the points moving the score tracker to that position, you're going to get the bonus. So for instance, if you had one of your cheerleaders on the four and the two and you managed to score four points moving the score over to here, you'd simply remove your cheerleader from the four track and you get the benefit of your cheerleader depending on what your coaching staff is and also you would also gain a fan check which is really nice. The other thing that you get is the coaching staff. Now there's three kind of coaches you can get. You can get an offensive coach, a defensive coach, and a support coach. An offensive coach basically allows you to let your players take up to three team actions max and that's for one player on your team so it's not overbalancing but it's a nice extra benefit so if you have one player, you can spend three actions on them, then play a card on them for four, of total act, four total actions on that one player. If you use a defensive coach, you get the ability to get extra defense dice, which is nice, but again, not overpowering. And finally, there's a support coach, and when you use your support coach, it actually allows you to put more cheerleaders out on the score track. And again, as soon as those score tracks are going to get those score points, your cheerleader is going to be removed and you're going to get extra fan checks. The more fan checks you get, the more coaching dice you get, the better your team's going to do. But finally, uh, just overall, Season 2 is a fantastic addition to the game. The teams are balanced. It's really enjoyable. I like how they all play differently. They're adding a lot of variety to the game. I'm really, really excited about Season number 3 with the additional four more teams that are coming across. They look pretty cool too. I haven't seen their statistics, but I'm really interested in the pterodons and their ability to teleport and how that's going to affect the board should be pretty interesting. I also am looking forward to the additional rules that are going to come out with Season 3. So far, everything about Dreadball has been fantastic, and this is coming from an old school Blood Bowl, Blood Bowl player who's been playing, well, I, let me correct myself, who used to play Blood Bowl. In all honesty, since Season 1 came out and I've had a few league games, I am actually haven't even pulled Blood Bowl out, and I don't think I've actually played it yet this year. Um, I may pull it out when Super Bowl comes out and when the football season starts, but that's kind of an old tradition among friends. We kind of make our own little fantasy league using Blood Bowl. But Dreadball has been fun. It's a quick playing game. We're liking the rules. We're liking the extra teams, and we're having a lot of fun with it. We're enjoying the fact that it plays a lot faster, a heck of a lot faster, to be honest with you. It plays it seems to play a lot cleaner, and so far... I'm going to have to say it's not the cult of the new. So far, we're seeing, seeming to agree that Dreadball right now is just due, just due to the fact that it's really well balanced. All the teams seem to play really well. Right now, we're thinking it's probably going to be the better game. Now, everything about Season 2 isn't absolutely perfect. I do have one small complaint about Season 2, 
and it's not with the rules it's with the Jud one team miniatures themselves now the Jud one team they're supposed to be a really scrawny alien type of race almost rem reminiscent of the 1950s sci-fi movies where they had the really thin rubbery arms and unfortunately that doesn't translate really well to the miniatures who really kind of lack the detail that you see in some of the other miniatures if you compare the Zord team to the Jud one team you'll see that the quality of the miniatures while it's not bad, I'm not trying to say they're bad miniatures at all, you can see that the fact that they're scrawnier miniatures, they really don't have the bulkiness and the thickness of the miniatures, and they don't look quite as fantastic on the board. Especially if you compare them to some of the other games, such as stuff done by Fantasy Flight Games, or even Wizards of the Coast. Now again, I'm, I just want to emphasize, they're not terrible, they're not bad, the detail on them is decent, but when you see some of the quality of the Zor, the quality on the Void Sirens, and the quality on the other teams that have come out for the game, it slightly detracts from it. Again, it's just a minor quibble. Overall, I am really happy with the sculpts that came out with Season 2. I think they did a really good job. I think just the fact that what they chose to represent the Jedwan, a scrawny alien, didn't translate that well to plastic. I think they did good with what they had, but it doesn't look quite as good as the other quality of the miniatures. Overall, I'm going to say that Season 2 for Dreadball is fantastic. If you own Dreadball, get Season 2. You're going to be happy. The rules are great. The miniatures are overall very good, and the teams play really, really well. This has been an off-the-shelf board game review. Thanks for watching.